Improv is based on the idea that the group can come up with something more than any individual working independently. And the jelly bean jar is used in Psych 101 classes to show that even if no one can guess the number of jelly beans in it, the average of all the wrong guesses will be accurate. This seems to prove what Baudelaire said, which sounds cynical at first, that, thank God we misunderstand each other, otherwise we would never be able to agree. This is such a better way to understand collective consciousness, not as a consciousness, but as an unconscious we share, unavoidably, because we all have the same failures in saying what we would wish to say. My plan has always been to work from sources I trust because they work hard and go after the most difficult questions. Also, they cover the territory I want to cover, which is human subjectivity. My top three picks are Jacques Lacan, jean Battista Vico, and Joan Kopchik. I am by no means an expert in any of these thinkers. I only set them as a standard. Their questions are the ones we have to ask if we are going to understand any simple detail about human life. What I've noticed in contemporary architecture theory is that these three figures are largely absent. What do these three have in common? Taking Vico and Lacan, it's clear. Both are interested in how metaphor works as a basis for all speaking, thinking, and acting, and how the ability to make a metaphor initiated human life from the very beginning. The other thing is topology, which is a space of two dimensions, a surface that curves in on itself so that the inside is also officially the outside and vice versa. So my project of merging these two thinkers is also about their project of merging two ideas. Just as architecture theory seems to be missing Vico and Lacan, it is missing out on how metaphor and topology relate to each other. You would think architects would be keen on anything having to do with space, even if they weren't so much interested in metaphor. But they seem especially resistant to the idea of projective geometry, whose self-intersecting 2D surfaces are about a kind of efficiency and effectiveness that works in the background of everything human. Projectivity wasn't discovered until well after Euclid was well established. But it turns out that projective geometry is logically prior to Euclid. So there's this other question of how to explain how something can be second in history, but first as a foundational logic. Many architecture theorists hold on to Euclid as foundational and think of topology in terms of a spooky fourth dimension, even though it's more the case that Euclid is the spooky one. You don't add a fourth, you subtract a dimension to bring the vanishing point into the room, so to speak. In fact, infinity becomes something like anxiety, which is anxiety because it is too close over-present. Vico and Lacan say much the same about metaphor, that it is not something added to ordinary meaning. In fact, they say there's no such thing as ordinary meaning, and architecture theorists who rely on Paul Ricoeur have missed the point. Metaphor is about the subtraction of meaning that brings a vanishing point into the room and makes it something akin to anxiety. If we follow recur on metaphor, we will forever miss this important point. Architecture theorists get in a tizzy talking about perspective, and the ones who still believe Euclid's fifth postulate still want to push the vanishing point into a spooky fourth dimension. But they fail to notice how cultures in general have pulled the vanishing point into a confrontational situation where we stand face to face with our own mortality. This is something we can't look at in any ordinary way, 
So art and literature construct a special form of virtuality to handle this uncanny situation. And we might as well give it an operational name at this point, which would be anamorphosis. This conference gives me the chance to talk about anamorphosis under its other names, mainly those that come out of culture's many traditions dealing with the uncanny. Primarily, I'll deal with the ones that use the tube as a line of fire where self-intersection is simultaneously non-orientation, as when we look at the skull, a memento mori, a reminder of death. Anyone who has visited the Capuchin Monastery in Rome will remember the small sign that is the universal caption of this moment. It says, I once was who you are, but what I am is what you will be. This is time running forward and backward at the same time, and there can be no better description of what projective geometry is or how it works inside metaphor. The skull is not just at the end of the hallway, but it shows us the way down the hallway as a line of sight that tells a story. To see the blur in the painting of the ambassadors, you have to kneel at a point which is directly beneath a half-hidden crucifix, putting you at the position of Golgotha, which the Bible tells us meant the place of the skull. This was not just any skull, but Adam's skull, and to find yourself at this position, held in place by the optics of the anamorphic blur, meant that you were bringing things full circle. You were at the end of history, just as Adam was at the beginning. Lacan analyzed this painting, but didn't know about John North's analysis of the geometry of lines at special 27-degree angles that told the full story about the skull in relation to this mega encounter of creation with the apocalypse. You have to turn the painting over to get this new clue. Lacan may have missed this key information, which John North's analysis uncovered, but he would have said that it confirmed what he thought, namely that the painting is about the completion that has to be done in Euclidean space by a trick of combining the recto and verso into a single plane. That plane is the 2D of time that connects Adam's skull with the one we see anamorphically to indicate the precise time of apocalypse. We get the idea because of the trick of over-precision. No painter says that they finish a painting on a certain minute, so the 4 p.m. of the inscription must be saying something else. The over-precise reference to 4 p.m. connects the local painting to the cosmic situation, since this was the exact time astrologers had predicted the end of the world. At 4 p.m., the sun would be exactly 27 degrees over the horizon of London, getting ready to set on Good Friday, April 11th in 1533, when the number three would combine with itself to say to the human race, that time's up. Anamorphosis here is more than just a pretty picture, or rather, more than just an ugly picture. It's a way of holding the viewer accountable by requiring the point of view to be unique and fixed. Let me use a new word to describe this, idempotency, the power to stay the same, or the power of the same, a power of identity. The point is artificially constructed by Holbein's painting, but it's to make the point that this kind of paralysis is the loss of a dimension, from three Euclidean dimensions to two, to set a kind of topological trap. Although the surface the viewer now finds him or herself in has no boundaries, it also has no means of escape. Like death individually, in the apocalypse collectively, the world will live up to its etymology, meaning that it will curve around so that the end meets the beginning. 
Holbein is not the only artist to use concealment, of course, and not even the only artist to use concealment under the name of anamorphosis, but he is the first to give such an explicit roadmap linking the skull to the passageway where we have to be reminded of what we inevitably suppress, that is, the fact of our own death. Without this suppression, of course, we couldn't live. We need a minimal degree of enjoyment. But once we suppress something, we leave behind the fear that it produced, which floats around like a dark cloud. And because it floats around, it casts a shadow over things that seem to be completely unrelated. Any time we look at something, even a picture of two rich guys, we feel an uncanny unease, a stain on our looking, which is both between us and what we look at and within the object itself. The skull is a reminder that our temporality is not simply a hallway leading us from the known past to the unknown future. It is the reminder that has us think that the vanishing point at the end of the hallway is about the bi-temporality or bilateral temporality that has two directions lying side by side. We only notice this if we stop suddenly and look down at our feet and forget which way we are going. This is why the labyrinth, the first famous prison of architecture, used a meander rather than a maze. We see the skull outside of us in the infinite distance of death, but we simultaneously realize that it's not just in us, but behind us, behind our vision, our visibility, which we have mistakenly taken to be the same thing. If we give geometry and metaphor a new name, anamorphosis, it's because we recognize that concealment is fundamental to human experience in ways that address how metaphor goes back to the separation of the traumatic event from our response to it, the way that feeling retains form even when the thing that made it has been concealed. The curve that history seems to make when it makes the end of the story answer to the beginning is nothing more or less than the topological trap we set for meanings, so that they don't escape, so that all details are held accountable, even the ridiculous ones. This idea of answering to or accountability is about the way we see thought and speech in terms of judgment, a judgment that always comes at the end, at the vanishing point, where infinity comes up to meet us in ways that Euclid would never allow. Obviously, any conference about concealment is going to give the Oscar to Edgar Allan Poe for the story that has it all, The Purloined Letter. I won't review it myself because I'm sure others are going to do this, but there is something working behind the scenes in this story that is easy to overlook. This is the way the word purloined denotes two things lying side by side. The spatial positioning and parallel laying out deserves our architectural attention. The police waste a lot of time trying to explore the dimensions of space that they think lie beyond the Euclidean view. But Poe explicitly tells us in the title that the dimension of hiding runs parallel to the dimension of exposure. This is like saying that synthesis is parallel to analysis and not something like answers put at the back of the book. The aha moment of the purloined letter comes when we realize the geometric implications of purloined. This means that the cut we typically make to separate ordinary Euclidean space from the spooky fourth dimension is internal rather than an outer bound. Space is cut inside itself, but simultaneously this introduces an exteriority to space at the point where it is the most intimate. This is Lacan's idea of extimacy, or extimité in French, 
Can architecture really do without this idea? Aren't all things relating to concealment a matter of this connection of the inside with the outside? The purloined letter is very clever. It connects topology and metaphor through a term that they both share, kenosis, which is what we know, but we don't know that we know. In other words, the unconscious. This is my case, that this story forces us to recognize the critical relation between architecture and psychoanalysis, thanks to a theme that both architecture and psychoanalysis can claim as their own, anamorphosis, the fact that we look at things that remain resistant to our looking. Architecture is both about looking at something and moving around outside and inside it, and still not being able to find something concealed within its own virtuality. Kenosis and anamorphosis are two sides of the same coin. The cut is not just between the observer, who is looking for something that is already present inside him or her, but inside the thing that is being looked at. So it's no accident that we are curiously attracted to divisions that are not just between parts of space, but between two entirely different kinds of space held within one spatial frame. In this famous scene from Playtime, the infinity is played out as the abnormally long time it takes for the official to reach Monsieur Hulot as he impatiently waits. I juxtapose Piero della Francesco's flagellation of Christ to create a montage space also showing the relation of secular temporality to the eternal event. My methodology is not to prove what I'm thinking about metaphor and topology, or to prove to anyone that it's the way to go in architecture theory, but rather to show that others in history have been thinking about the same thing, and not just that, but using the same means of getting past simple representation and into the meaningfulness of this relationship. Given the diversity and contingencies of history, it can't be an accident that so many important examples have come down to us intact so that we can read all the details clearly. So in Poe, we have the folded letter. In Las Meninas, we have the space folded simply by turning the canvas around that seems to represent what the painting sees when it looks back at us. Lacan uses this to show how the gaze works, the drive that takes the visual form of a blank or void in the visible, and is thus the essence of anamorphosis. Folding space is a kind of origami, and it's useful at this point to say that there are problems in Euclidean geometry that cannot be solved with a compass and straight edge, but can be solved by folding the paper where something is drawn. The same is true for writing, where écrits are secrets if you pronounce them les écrits, as the students of Lacan did in the 1960s. Holbein, Velázquez, and even Tati are writing something down in order to fold the medium itself to conceal something. This makes the visual more like radio, what Marshall McLuhan called a hot medium in that the audience has to be engaged. This is the engagement of perception with the thing perceived, which gives up the dimension of detachment in favor of enigma and metaphor. You may say it's an accident, and maybe accident is involved, but the traditional interior decoration of concealment involves a curtain. And this has been true since the story of Zoixis and Parasios in Pliny the Elder's version, where the contest between two famous painters was won by the clever Parasius, who instead of providing a realistic trompe l'oeil, painted a curtain that the judges mistook for a real one. We don't know what's behind the curtain, but we always accept the attempt to conceal as authentic. And so we imagine what's behind it with a special glee. 
which is maybe why Picasso, whom I add to this list of famous cases of concealment, decided to reveal a brothel in the painting Demoiselle d'Avignon, a brothel suddenly exposed by a figure on the left who in early versions of this famous painting of 1908 was a medical student holding a skull. There are two masked companions who pull curtains back. We think of two eyes with lids that open to show us the visible world. But here there is a more cosmic meaning, thanks to the seated figure. There are two important historical references for this painting. One of the curtain holders, the one in back, is pulling back not just a curtain like the brown one in front. It's the actual sky, a background we take to be ultimate only until time itself comes to a stop, as it does in the apocalypse. This moment is shown by the angel painted by Giotto in the Scrovini Chapel in Padova on the back wall that shows the last day, when the sky itself is rolled up as if it had been the screensaver of reality, but now that the operating system is crashed, so must the graphic interface. The other reference is Dürer's famous emblem style engraving of melancholia. He misspells it on purpose so that melancholy becomes the anagram for limoncella or the gate of heaven, making the same point about this back curtain. Because Picasso put melancholy as the seated figure directly into his painting, we can superimpose Dürer's image onto Picasso's to speculate about the geometrical solid in the middle that now is about the two women who most take to be prostitutes of the original scandalous scene. If anything is a scandal, it's the scandal of this truncated triangular trapezohedron, which has been analyzed on account of its many amazing properties, not the least of which is the way its angles sum up to nine, the same way Holbein's Angles of the Apocalypse did, and the same way Dante used the number nine in his Vita Nova, meaning both the nine life and the new life. Claude Bragdon showed how Dürer's solid was really a cube falling through a plane. So what we see is a solid that was extruded from a shadow in freefall, or a cube that has been rotated into and out of itself, producing the famously non-Euclidean value of the cube root of two. When we say double, we could mean either two things are like twins, or that one thing has doubled a size. In the case of doubling a cube, this is not just a problem for Euclidean-minded humans. It was the problem in the plague years in Athens in 430 BC. It was so much of a problem that literally life depended on it. Apollo wanted a bigger altar, it seemed, and until the Athenians could figure a way to give it to him, they would continue to die in the horrible pandemic. Not having access to ivermectin or QAnon, the Athenians were charged by the Sibyl to figure out how to double the size of the altar. Just making another altar the same size was out of the question, and those who thought that an altar whose sides were twice as long had simply flunked their geometry exam. The trick came from, again, origami, since the slave boy interrogated by Socrates to show that the kid was aware, in the kenosis kind of way, of the Pythagorean theorem involved folding the surface of the demonstration to show that the one and same triangle was half of one square but a quarter of another if you folded the papyrus the right way. Again, origami was succeeding where Euclid had failed, and the result was an irrational number, the square root of two. 
Doing it in three dimensions with a cube rather than a square was a bit tricky, of course, but it revealed 2,500 years before Einstein that space could be folded as well as a piece of paper because in both cases, a 2D surface would be created that was self-intersecting and non-orienting, just what a perfect altar to Apollo should be. Gods, too, need a front door and a back door, a void in the place where we look at them and a void where they look back at us. This Lacanian theology overturns the idea of the external gods out there somewhere on Mount Olympus, pulling the strings of mortal puppets below. The hole in front and hole in back idea comes from projective geometry, where of course the two holes are really one hole. But to experience the 2D surface, we have to imagine them as separate holes. You don't get holier than that. You get holier than thou, which means that you see the gods were projections all along. I've just given away the secret given away by Giambattista Vico, who in his major work, The New Science, did he mean new or nine, showed that the ancient gods of the first humans were metaphoric projections of these humans' own fierce natures, projected not onto the front of appearances, but back projected to make the gods seem as if they had something to hide. Vico's original theory of metaphor appears nowhere in Paul Ricoeur's otherwise exhaustive inventory. So architecture theory has not had much of a chance to understand it. But Vico also employed topology to get his idea across. But again, architecture theory has not heard much about it because its main advocates have used an abridged edition of Vico's new science that cuts out all of the visual materials Vico employed to state his entire argument in one image, called the De Pintura, showing human culture as the product of extromission from a divine eye emanating from behind the clouds, on to metaphysics, then to the first poet Homer, and then to all things humans invented to exploit the earth. What we may not notice is how this image is topological. Metaphysics stands on a celestial sphere. The sky is turned inside out, so that we are technically speaking in a space beyond space. The sphere is half off the altar, so maybe this means that metaphysics is trying to double the altar. We are simultaneously outside space, but at the same time on the inside of the story of space. Vico tells a story by explaining every object in the image except for one, the helmet of Hermes, making this object a visual lipogram, a missing letter, or shall we say a purloined letter. Most people think that the eye at the top is the divine eye of God, and Vico says as much to fool the censors of the Inquisition who had to approve his book before he could publish it. But if the space is truly an origami surface, this will be a hole rather than an eye, or it will possibly be an eye we don't expect. The lipogram, the other hole, must match up to it in the same way that the voids that appear in the Klein bottle are really about the same hole, which is no hole. No holes are barred. And I'll tell you what I mean. The thaumatrope is a little disc that you spin so that the image on one side combines with the image on the other. Archaeologists have found thaumatropes in Magdalenian caves where they were possibly used as prayer wheels to ensure successful hunting. Also, they are the first examples of cinema where images that flicker back and forth are taken to be action animations. In the case of Vico's image, the De Pintura, there are two holes, just like the two holes in the thaumatrope, but also there is a kind of back engineering going on. 
We see the action animation of history, but we may actually be looking at two separate images that have anamorphically combined to give us the illusion of motion. We can prove this by looking at the divine eye, the hole in back of the scene, in connection with the helmet of Hermes, the hole in front. Vico's image is, and we know that this is true because he tells us it's true, an animation. It is the story of the ideal eternal history, a film that is run by every culture in every age. It is also the film spun by individuals in their everyday experience, a kind of portable, rescalable thaumatrope that constitutes the virtuality of effectiveness, the invisible spatiality of how things happen, not the virtuality of Euclidean perspective, which shows you how things might have happened differently. Vico's theory of reading is like Lacan's principle of media, of saying things by halves. Vico writes the book, but the reader writes it again, doubling the size of the altar, so to speak in a reading that is able to see the cut in the text, which is confirmed by the cut in the image. The cut is the theory of reading transferred from the flip of space Lady Metaphysics has accomplished by redirecting the divine eye beam onto Homer, in the same way the reader will use the text extromissively to see how what first appeared to be the external world is in fact something both in and behind his or her own subjectivity. This makes Vico's new science a major treatise on the subject of anamorphosis and how anamorphosis involves seeing a cut that others don't see. If the new science is a mirror machine, it is also the internalization of the vanishing point at the radical center of thinking itself. If I haven't guessed the correct number of jelly beans in the jar, then I trust that the truth of the matter is our collective misreadings of Vico and eventually the consideration of the topological and metaphorical connections put forward by Lacan and Vico that up to now are still purloined letters in architecture theory. I've laid out a more detailed argument in a position paper which although it is true that I get a lot of crazy ideas in my dreams, is based on my some 30 years of reading and writing on Vico and Lacan. Because other writers have presented Vico to architecture audiences before me, and more effectively, you will know Vico as a hermeneutical phenomenologist. Let me say only that my reading suggests that this isn't a good descriptor. My advice is that when you read Vico and Lacan for yourselves, that you use Vico's unabridged version of the new science, and also his lectures and smaller works, but also that when you try to read Lacan, you will remember the principle of media, which means that the reader and the writer are the real writer. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference on the architectures of hiding for conversations that, over the years, have made me appreciate the value of doing theory in architecture, where the question of philosophy is really a question about the human subject, and where the question of why things happen is really a question of not so much about when we are as where we are.